feral breeze now and up we go. <laughs> the man in the basket is David Quite Turner. Away. He's 26 years old. By profession, he's a civil engineer. By inclination, he's a designer, maker and flyer of kites. And he's dedicated to the idea of building a train of kites to lift himself off the ground. Is that a job, holding it down, Dave? Um, it's just difficult balancing. You need to have something to hold on to here. That's why it probably needs another turn. This program isn't just about David Turner and his man lifters. It's about kites of all shapes and sizes. Kites for pleasure, kites for profit. Your reporter, Gwyn Richards. Well, why don't we take all our beautiful birds and fishes and insects out of the sky and go right back to the beginning of the kite story. And I'd like you to think of this program as the story of the gradual development of kite design. It's a story that begins in the mysterious east and it flies splendidly over to the west. Now, David Turner, that looks to me like a pretty basic kite. It is. It's the one that everyone knows. It's the diamond-shaped kite, sometimes known as the Malay kite. Malay kite. Yeah. Well, to me, if I could just turn it round, yeah. it looks very much like the kite I built as a small boy. I got two sticks and I tied them together in the middle like that and covered it with a handkerchief or something. But it was very difficult to fly it. Well, they are, because there's no stability on the kite. It tends to dart around all over the sky, and you can't tell what it's going to do. And before very long, it goes into the ground and will probably break. So we'll, we'll bring it down here. There we see the first problem of designing kites, how to design your kite, to build it, and to send it up in the air and make it stay there. It's what, for centuries, the kite designers have tried to achieve, what we call lift, and it goes up, and stability. It stays there once it's there. And this is the very simple way of putting a tail on the kite. And that should do the trick, shouldn't it, David? That should do the trick, yeah. Let's try and get that up. Yes, it's doing it quite well, in fact. Now, on my kite, I just used a piece of string and some pieces of newspaper tied at intervals. Is that good enough? That will do the job fine, yes, as long as it's about five times as long as the length of the kite, something like that. Uh, you can use any material you like. Now, what's this one? This is a uh, serpent kite. The idea originally came from Thailand, but they've used them in Ceylon and even in, in Europe earlier on. Well, the tail is made of crepe paper. It's uh, <laughs> an easy material to use. How long and is it, for goodness sake? We'll put it up in the air and you can see the whole thing then. It's about 70 foot long. And on this one, the tail, rather than being purely functional, is also included in the design of the kite, so it makes it very attractive. There's another method of keeping your kite nice and steady in the sky. Even today, it's still one of the solid, basic principles of aerodynamic design. It's called dihedral. I promise you that's as technical as we're going to get. But David, I should think 
like many brilliant innovations, it was arrived at almost by accident, wasn't it? Yes. I should think the early kite flowers, many centuries ago, were probably using flexible spars on the, the crossbar here. And that is dihedral, is it? A flexible crossbar. That's right. I'll show you how we're going to take the same kite that we had the tail on, bow it back like this, just as you would bow a, a bow, like a bow and arrow. Well, then imagine that the wind is coming onto the kite like this. As soon as the kite tends to try and twist round, there is more wind on this half of the kite now, so the wind pressure will force that round and you have a self-regulating mechanism which will always align the kite with the wind. Show me what you mean. Okay. Well, that's still the same kite. It hasn't got its tail and it almost has a completely different personality. It's almost completely static in the sky, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's very much better now. If you'd like to try and hold that, you'll find it's very simple indeed. Well, that is such a basic part of kite flying that we're going to show you some more. This next one is another dihedral kite again. Rather than being bowed, the wings are fixed at a, an angle. But as you can see, it's quite a familiar shape, that kite. A much bigger dihedral kite is this one built by Joe Whiffen. And the original kite was quite famous in its day, wasn't it, Joe? Yes, this kite was originally built by Charles Brogdon in 1903. And when he built it, it won a height contest uh, for the Royal Aeronautical Society. I found their original journal for 1903 and found the design in there and built it from there. But there are three dihedrals there, aren't there, Joe? Yeah, three dihedrals and three slots as well, which also help the stability of the kite. Can I just feel that? Oh, there's a tremendous pull on that. Ah, and what a difference between this one, the Brogdon kite, and the little kite next to it, the delicate, elegant little bird kite. Once again, that one too is flying by courtesy of dihedral. You can have a lot of fun with using dihedral to make all sorts of strange shapes fly in the air. We'll try this one, it's a, it's a kit. Okay, put it up. Now this kite known as the ghost clipper, quite an unusual one. It certainly is. You can, you can see that you can make all sorts of strange shapes fly in the air. Is that difficult to fly? Wind. It needs a little bit more wind than this, actually, this one, but I think we're going to get it up. <laughs> there we go. Got something there. That is very beautiful. Once again, that's dihedral. Each one of those sails, how many? Fifteen, are there? Uh, oh, three, ma three masts with five, five sails mm. on, yeah. It's, they're all dihedral, so you've got a, a very unusual shape, but this gives it a certain amount of stability and will make it stay up, even though normally a thing like that wouldn't dream of staying up. <laughs> the only trouble is, is it tends to be a bit fragile, and... Uh, it can break in about a hundredth of the time it takes to make it. But you can see it needs a fair amount of attention, because even with all that dihedral, there's an awful lot of unsupported weight there, which is going up largely to strengthen the whole thing. That essential magic of dihedral turns up in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And I suppose in these very early and traditional Indian fighting kites, David, that the dihedral is really purely accidental, isn't it? Yes, it's accidental, or probably discovered accidentally, but it's of fundamental importance the way this kite works. It's a very flat kite and has no directional stability when there's no wind on it, but as soon as you get wind, the wings bend, and that gives it a direction. We can see how easy it works. It's made of paper with very flexible split bamboo spars, isn't it? That's it, it's made of split bamboo. The wings are tapered down to give it a finer dihedral at the wingtips, and then it's covered in tissue paper. Are they it's difficult to fly? No, they're very, very easy to fly once you've mastered the basic principles, although they take about half an hour or so to pick up. Do you think you could fly it up to the camera platform up there, look? That's a long yeah, way up. Yeah, I think up. we can do that. So the principle is that as the kite inclines in one way or the other, you give it a good fierce jerk, do you? That's right. Now are you, you see, you see are how you can make it right, it? left, you... right. Just make it swing round over the left. That's it. What's the tradition of fighting these kites in India? Well, you get lots of boys and all sorts of people, in fact, go in for the kite fighting there. And what they do is they climb from the roof of their houses in the evening when there's a very light wind, and they zigzag the kite about the sky, just like this. You can see how it's going across the sky, like that, and that's an invitation for someone to come and fight them. Now, what we try and do is cross over each other's line, and that way you can, you can saw through his line by the friction. You cross over and then pay out line very quickly. Saw it through? Yep. You use glass-coated line, like cotton line, which has got ground glass on it. 
He's just chasing after me there. He's going to better hide, but cut me down very quickly. <laughs> you use glass cated line, and the friction on that will cut through just about anything, even thick rope if you rub it against it long enough. I don't know about kites, David. They look to me almost like oriental fighting fish, zipping about in a giant aquarium of blue sky. <laughs> Now, we're just jostling for the right position here. Someone's going to get cut in a minute. Ah, oh, mine's gone. You're quite out of breath there. It's quite an exciting well, it, sport, it, isn't oh, it? Oh, can't. a fight can go on for half an hour if you, if you don't... Well, if you're, if you're really playing for positions, you both know what you're doing. And what happens to your kite if there's a really strong wind? Well, if he's a good flyer, what he'll do is fly after it, let line out, and then he can make his kite spin round and tangle up with my line. And then he can bring the two kites back together and he gets to keep his kite. Otherwise, I might have to run for miles over there. <laughs> you remember our little Malay? Well, this is Nick Morse's giant Malay. It's 12 foot high and it has a 12 foot wingspan. All right. OK, we've got a bit of wind here. I'm going to launch it now, right? OK, push it up. Fine, it's lovely. Now, what's the breaking strain on a, on a line like that? It's about 200 pounds. Nick, was it just a problem of scaling up that smaller Malay kite? More or less, apart from one thing, um, <coughs> you have such a, a wider wingspan and that's got to be supported. This dihedral angle has got to be supported. I did this by using a king post with a, a couple of long tension lines coming off to stop it bending right back and folding up. You still have to have that dihedral? Yes, that dihedral is an essential part for the stability of the kite. Why does a professional <laughs> kite builder like you pursue such a, a massive project as putting this one in here? Well, I just like to make a kite that was um, on the limits of what you could handle in, in most winds. What, one man can fly on his own? Yes, yeah, so one man can fly on his own. At this point in our kite story, we leave behind those beautiful eastern kites and move firmly into the western hemisphere. Now, people in Europe, of course, had been flying kites for centuries, but never with quite the same fanaticism or religious fervor as the people in the East. It wasn't until 1890 that we got a new kite, the box kite. It was invented by an Englishman, Lawrence Hargrave, who'd emigrated to Australia, and in its day it was a totally revolutionary kite design. Martin Lester, why does the box kite fly so well? Well, it's got these large horizontal surfaces which give it a lot of lift and these vertical surfaces that give it a lot of stability. There's a combination of lift and stable, stable flight. Well, this is about half the size of a kite that Hargrave might have built. Will she fly in this kind of breeze? I hope so. Is this far enough? That should be fine. There she goes. Yes, that's, that's got plenty of lift, hasn't it? And when she's up there, it remains pretty, pretty static, pretty stable. And is this what Hargrave was looking for, really? Yes. Stability in the sky? Stability and a lot of lift. Now, a lot of kite designers patent a new design, but Hargrave didn't. Why was that? Well, he wanted everyone to share what he learned from his own kites. Well, he certainly profited from that, because I know box kites were used right up to the middle of the 1920s, weren't they? Yeah. To lift yeah. meteorological instruments and even early forms of aerial photography. Yes. Yes. So I think he proved his point. To you and me, of course, that's just a box kite. But if you're a kite man, you might well call it a cellular kite. And if you think of a cell as being just a small compartment or a room, then you soon begin to get the idea. But a cell doesn't have to be box-shaped. It can be, for instance, a pyramid. And if it was a pyramid, then a kite man might call it a tetrahedral. Nick Morse, how does a tetrahedral fly? Well, basically, you have the four sides of a tetrahedron, one, two, three, and four, and you cover two of those sides with fabric. And you point uh, this edge here into the wind, and these act rather like wings of a bird, and it flies in that way. Using dihedral, in fact? Well, it is rather like a dihedral, yes. Would that single unit work? It will, but it has to have a tail to stabilize it. But you find that if you uh, take four of the cells and put them together in this fashion here, um, they all brace each other in, in this formation, and this bottom one here helps it to steer and point into the wind. So, once again, in the kite story, with a little help from their friends, these wonderful objects begin to take the air. What's the interest for you and the attraction in, in building something like that? Well, uh, I'm just fascinated by the 
fact that the, when you see it flying, the, you see different facets and parts of the structure in the air. And um, of course, the other thing is that you can go on with this system, adding and adding and adding cells until you have a very large structure, which looks just like, as I say, a huge flying sculpture and forms a really fascinating object in the sky. Well, this certainly is the kite that grows and grows and grows. Nick, how many pyramids have we got in the kite now? Uh, 46. 46. <laughs> and there she makes a really beautiful shape. And presumably you can just go on and on and on. Yes, you certainly can. Up to something like uh, 25 to 30 foot wingspan. And we know we have to put it down absolutely square to the tie line. We've now got a long walk to the launching point. But where did the idea for this construction come from? Well, I saw a lot of photographs of uh, Alexander Graham Bell's great tetrakites. He was the man who invented the telephone. He did indeed. What was he doing meddling in kites? Well, from the profits he made from his invention, he set up a, 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 an establishment to research into man-powered flight. And uh, this was his uh, final solution. Uh, he attempted to put an engine in it. And he wanted something that was very safe and very strong. Have you improved on his design, do you think? Well, only in so far as the way um, it's put together. It's much simpler to put together, and it's completely collapsible. Um, well, I don't envy you your task, but well, have you got enough wind? I think I have, yes, certainly. I'll just gently ease it up, and then I'm going to run back and launch it. OK, right. we're getting ready for a launch now. <laughs> right, here it goes. Oh, God, that's amazing. That's well and truly up. That would be fine. And you mean you could really build on that shape and make it even bigger? Yes, much bigger, much, much bigger. You would have to introduce a few extra reinforcing struts or... So I'll give you some more it. line? But um, hopefully you can go up to something like several thousand cells, not hundreds. And he built one that was about 3,393 cells and had a 40-foot wingspan. He would have loved to have seen yours, I think. Nick. Yes, I'd love to have seen his. <laughs> Um, there was one instance where he lifted a man up, towed, towed it behind a boat, and um, uh, the man went up to about 163 feet, just flying this thing, and he came down again, and the ascent was so gentle that he didn't even realise he had landed on the water again. That's all very well, Nick. It was a beautiful lift and it looks absolutely wonderful up there, but how do you get it down? Well, just like any other kite, you gradually draw it in towards you and walk towards it as well. It's a combination of ways of doing it. Uh, this one is a little bit tricky. When it gets lower, it starts to tip about a bit if there's um, local ground turbulence. But um, in these conditions at the moment, they're absolutely excellent for this kite and I should be able to bring it down uh, completely by myself. I do have two helpers. Um, Dave and John, who will have instructed to um, grasp a certain point on each side um, if it does tip over. Let's hope it comes down okay. Let's when see. we were looking at the kite earlier, though, we had to be very careful to place it yeah. gently on the ground. What are the dangers of it breaking up if it hits the ground too hard? Well, the way it's structured in this case is uh, it can tip over and, and, and break, but on larger ones, of course, it will be designed so it won't do that at all. Now, can you really see something like this, as, as intrinsically delicate as this, lifting a man? Yes, it can be designed so that it is very safe, in fact. Here she now, comes. I think I can manage on my own, actually. OK, I'm now <laughs> going to bring it in. If you can stand back, I'll, I'll be OK. Back. So, I, I have to give you my applause for that, Nick. That's really beautiful. Perfect Beautifully handed. Absolutely perfect handed. Every invention, of course, immediately attracts its own folklore. And Dominique Jalbert, so the story goes, was sitting in his private aeroplane. He looked down at the wing and thought, why not make a wing out of fabric and allow the wind to inflate it into shape? That's how the new breed of inflatable kites came into being. Now, Sean Ronsley, is it really a kite or is it a wing? Well, I think it would be more true to describe it as a flying wing, entirely made of fabric. That is, there's not a single spar in it. And as you can see, 
it has an open front edge into which the wind blows and inflates it into an, a wing section. That is an airfoil shape. So now, is the wing or the kite relying in any way on the air inside it to hold it up, apart from creating a shape? Well, it merely provides an internal air pressure and the wing section itself, as an aeroplane wing, gives it its lift. So it's not like a balloon or anything else? No, there's no, it gives it, the air itself gives it no lift. See, it's just a crumpled heap of fabric on the ground. I was going to say, this must surely make it almost indestructible, doesn't it? Well, I mean, there's being, nothing to break, is there? There's nothing, nothing at all. I mean, this is indestructible fabric. Very portable. This is a quite a small one, but has considerable lift, even in, even in reasonably light wind like this. You can shake it out, and there it's the same principle. That's most impressive. What are they used for? These... Well, mainly. They're used for scientific research, for lifting meteorological instruments, for instance, or aerials, uh, because of their incredible lift and efficiency. See, it weighs nothing. But you have tried to improve on the Gelbert kites, um, haven't you? What's, what's the problem with the first edition, so to speak? To keep the thing inflated near the ground and in light winds, uh, one has to... Can I help? Yes, if you could take that side. OK. OK. This kite has no openings on the leading edge. In the centre, there are two pockets which keep the whole kite inflated. That's un on the underside of the kite? On the underside. That's where the air enters? Near the, near the middle. But it's still doing the same job? of keeping the, the structure inflated in, in an aerofoil wing shape? It's exactly the same, except it's much less liable to deflate under low wind conditions. Because they have achieved what the kite makers were looking for for so long, and that is tremendous stability. They just sit there, don't they? Extreme stability and incredible lift for the pack volume and weight. There's just one thing I want to say, and it's important, and that is that the electricity generating board have asked us to say that you must not fly your kites near overhead power lines. Most kites are sold with at least 200 feet of line. Those overhead lines sometimes come down as low as 17 feet above the ground, and they carry anything between 11,000 and 400,000 volts. If your kite line is in any way wet, you will be electrocuted. This is a solemn warning. A break in the weather now gives us the opportunity to have a look at some of the exciting kiting that in the last few years has really taken off. You'll forgive the expression. Because now we're into steerable kites, if I can keep it up there. And it was undoubtedly the Peter Powell stunter which really caught people's imagination. Even I can fly it. You pull to the left and down she goes, pull to the right, down she goes, pull straight together, and she goes up just like an ordinary kite. I'm on two lines, of course. There are several kinds of steerable kites around now. We're going to have a look at some of them. And it's that 70 foot long inflating tail, of course, which really makes this kite spectacular.
So far, we've been talking about thoroughbred kites. That's kites which rely on only one principle to keep them flying. But now we're into crossbreeds, or what we call compound kites. David, what are the mixtures of kites which have produced this one? Well, this is very much like a, a box kite. It's a slightly oblong box kite, but the interesting feature about it is it's got these wings which stick out in all the corners. So what you've got is much more lift on the kite than a normal box kite, but you've got all of the vertical sides to give you the stability. Good, I know there are all kinds of compound designs. Martin, if you could take that, thank you. What's this white, white one here? Well, this is a, a very interesting new design. You can, the new designs that can be made up all the time. You see this one looks very much like a snowflake from that angle, although it looks from that angle a bit more like a winged box kite again. But this gives you a lot of lift. There's a very lightweight frame, but a huge amount of sail area. And the great advantage of it is that even if it turns round, it still looks exactly the same at that angle as it does at that. So you can turn it any way around. See how she flies? Just get these bridles here. Pull it just, just from here. That's right, it's nice and steady. If you hold it there, on that point there, it should stay up there. Thank you. Now we seem to be coming into a, quite a different kind of kite. A rather period look about this one, David. That's right. Well, about the turn of the century, people were deciding that kites would be a very useful way of getting observers up into the sky to look down on enemy lines. The British and the French were very keen on this so that they could see what was going on. And this kite was one of the ones that was being developed for lifting people. A kind of spy in the sky, you mean? That's, that's very much it like it, look yeah. down on the enemy lines. That's it. It looks like two front halves of two box kites side by side, but the back is completely different. It's got that cruciform section, very much like the tailplane of an aeroplane. Well, that's leading us into really quite a very important story, because the, the compound kite that we really want you to look at is this one. Now, what are the main characteristics of this? This is uh, a double box kite, if you like, as opposed to that last one we saw with the single box kite, but it has very much more extended wings. And, uh, and the conditions, you I can hope, see how right. easy it is to fly. If you just pull that up, it should rise straight up by itself. There she goes. We we'll take you with it. And it was this kite and designs like it, which were built by a very flamboyant and colourful figure round about the turn of the century, who was one of the greatest names in flying. His name was Samuel Franklin Cody, an American born in Texas in 1861. A flamboyant, colourful man with immense zest for anything he tackled. Cowboy, bronco buster, failed gold digger, and part of a travelling Wild West act. Eventually, Cody brought his family to England where he started his own Wild West show. This was in the 1880s. He caught the kite flying disease from his small son, and he caught it so badly that the war office hired him to develop a system of man-lifting kites. In 1906, he was appointed chief kite instructor to design and make kites and teach soldiers and sailors how to fly them. And fly they did, using adapted gun carriages as winches, lifting one soldier to a record height of 2,600 feet. In the 1914 to 18 war, the Navy used man lifters so that observers could look across the curvature of the earth and spot the enemy fleet long before the enemy could spot them. So this is the first train of Cody man-lifting kites for over 70 years. They've been manufactured by David Turner and his friends at the Kite Workshop, partly from Cody's own designs, partly using their own intelligence. Okay. Is that that's square, isn't it? Yep. Mm. Right. right off there. It's nice and tight. Yeah. This is the first of the lifter kites, and there are two more, the pink one and the yellow one. Have you used Cody's own plans? We used plans taken from drawings, but we haven't used Cody's original materials. He used bamboo and silk. We're using aluminium and nylon, ripstop nylon. Bamboo must have, must have had to be terribly strong, even so. It's very strong material, but it's just not always too predictable. I and mean, here's the basket that you're going to be riding in. It well, was a basket like this that Cody himself rode in. That's right. He's a great hero of ours, and we've been working towards this for a very long time now. And it uh, looks like the first occasion we can actually get it all in one place and get it working. What's the first stage from now? Okay, we're going to put this one up. This is the pilot kite. It tows up 
a lightweight line which will then tow up the heavier line which takes all the rest of the kites. So just let's <coughs> recap for everybody's benefit, mine as much as anyone's. We have the pilot kite which is the first one to rise up into the sky underneath the pilot kite 500 feet of line. Now the pilot kite is carrying the light line that draws up the heavier main kite line. Below the pilot kite are the three lifter kites. They're bearing the main weight of the, of the line. Underneath the lifter kites is the main carrier kite. The big black one we see here, what they call Cody's war kite, and underneath the carrier kite is David Turner in his basket. It's a big moment for him, David. Can we get the okay, yeah. carrier kite into the air? Keep, put it up. That is absolutely staggering. To start off with, they'll keep letting the kite drop down and pick it up. And as it drops down, they pay out more line. Once again, this is the pilot kite taking up the first 500 feet of light line. Did it take Cody a long time, a lot of experimentation, before he arrived at this final system? Oh, he was working on it for several years. I think by the time he had just about got this perfected, he then the motor became available and he then started working on aircraft. The wind's looking pretty good up there. We shall put this one up, probably up to 500 foot, but if the line starts sagging, we'll then break the line at that point and tie it onto the main line. We don't want the pilot kite to have a sagging line, or well, that will tend to pull the next kite back down again. But are the wind conditions good for the experiment today? Yeah. yeah. Cody used to lift anything from 15 miles an hour up to 40 miles an hour, and we've got about 13, 14 at the moment. Yeah. You can see why Cody used this kite. It's so stable in the air. Its only movement is up and down as they're letting the line out but it doesn't move at all from one side to the other. It's got all the, the vertical panels in it, which gives it a tremendous amount of lateral stability. Can you hold it between you? I'll tie this onto the main line now. Have you now put the pilot kite up as high as it needs to go? It's just about there, yeah. I've left a bit of slack here. And that's all that's needed is a simple knot from the light line to the main line. That's right. Start letting the main line out now. Five hundred feet above us, the pilot kite hangs in the air. Below, Martin and Joe are hanging on the end of the light line and the beginning of the main line. And our problem now is to start placing the lifter kites on the main line. This is done with a series of cones developed by Cody and reproduced now for this experiment. How do the cones work, David? Well, we can't launch the rest of the lifter kites from down here. They have to be put, they have to be put onto the line, and then they run up the line. They have a ring attached to their bridle. There are three different size rings and three different size cones. The largest cone goes at the top, and the other two cones get smaller. So the first lifter kite is attached to the line. And it's the first, blown up. The first lifter kite has the largest ring. The first lifter kite has the largest ring. Yes. It blows up. And because it's got a larger ring than the other cones, it runs over them and will then lock on here. So that cone is a kind of stopper? It's a stopper, yeah. The ring hits that and won't go any further, and that's the first lifter kite in position. That's right. It's a very clever system that Cody devised like this, because the harder it pulls on there, the harder it clamps the cone together. We let's clamp these together with little bolts through here. Let's see how the cones fit on. This is the second cone we have here. That's Split right. open, this ready for people to this see. This is the next one down. That clamps onto the line like that. And this cone, this half of the cone, then fits over the top, and we bolt through here, through here, through here, and through here. Can I just show one feature of these that people would be interested to see? And that is the inside of the cone, the groove in there is rifled to give it the maximum grip on this rather hard, shiny rope. Let's put them together again. OK, just locks on there, and these bolts will go in here. Now, we, at what distance are these cones placed on the main line? Well, we shall have this about 40 foot down from this cone. 
So our next job is to let out some more line and attach this down 40 foot below here. Let's do that right away. Martin and Joe, can we start letting out some more line? Every part of this operation is in a way a new discovery because this is the first time since SF Cody perfected his man lifting system that it's all been put into operation again. Every part of the system as we have it today has been tested on its own but never before have they all been brought together. Okay, stop. Another foot. This is the second of the cones, smaller than the first, first one. Okay, we're ready to go up again. Right. The time has now come to put on the first lifter kite. Uh, this one has to go up now to take up all the slack that we're developing in the main line here. The main line itself is getting... It's starting to weigh down. There's a lot of drag yes. on there from so, the so wind. the pilot kite can't, can't take the weight of the main line now? No, no. Well, it's, you need two of these to take that lot up. There's a, there's a lot of drag coming from there and also the cones are weighing, weighing it all down. So we put this one on. That will ride up over those cones, stop on the top cone, and we'll then start paying more line out until we get a fair old height, and then we can just put on as many of these as we need for the tension, which will probably be all four of them. And the lifter kite, the first lifter kite, should be ideally about how high when the full operation is, is complete? Well, it will be about, I should think, getting off at 1,200 foot, something like that. And this is part of the operation. We still don't know how it's, it's going to work. It's never been used yet. It's never so been used yet. It'll be interesting to see how well it works. We don't know how these rings are going to slip over the cones that they're designed for. Remember, this kite has got to slip over the first two cones. So over the first. <laughs> and as the wind well, it takes works. it, as the wind gets stronger, the higher the kite goes, it works. It's now got to get over that second cone and it has done the system's working and it's over again <laughs> the second ring below the kite is over david this is tremendous for it you, is isn't it? we're very excited to see this that's it and it's locked and it's on stopped. it's locked on the <laughs> first cone that's right now we have we have to start paying out some more line so that, that can get in some steady wind up we go Now that top kite is starting to find some steady wind. You can see it's gradually climbing up forwards. There's still a lot of weight of rope here. This kite again, if you remember, has got to cross over the first cone on the main line and then locate itself on the second cone. He's going That's it, it's off. steadily. David, how is this system developing for you now? Are you happy? <laughs> Better than we'd ever dreamt, yeah. It's going up so smoothly. From here, we can just see that first cone, and all we have to <laughs> hope is that she's going to slip over. <laughs> going with the first one. First ring straight is over. over, yes. And she's straight over, and the second, second lifter that's brilliant, it's lifted oh, and located. <laughs> Look at that. Look at the angle climb. Okay. Straight 
straight up. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear it on the line? Look at the angle it's Nearly there, getting <laughs> up to the third and the last cone. Is she going to make it? Over. <laughs> yeah, can we power the line? Power the line slowly. No, Nick, can we get the line? Well, let's get some line out and get some height. Okay. Do you want a cup of tea while we're doing this? It's not really lifting, is it? Just a word of warning, of course, before you all start rushing out to the nearest airfield and start lifting yourselves off the ground. When Cody was alive, the aeroplane had barely been invented. There were certainly no air navigation orders. There were no rules of the air, air traffic control regulations. And of course, there was very little chance of a mid-air collision because there was just nobody else up there. These days, unfortunately, the sky isn't quite so free. And to fly these kites today, we had to get special permission from the Civil Aviation Authority to fly kites above the normal legal limit of 200 feet. We have permission to fly up to 2,000 feet and even to lift a man off the ground. So far, so good. The pilot kites and the three lifter kites and 1,800 feet of line up in the air. There was wild excitement, of course, by the kite flyers, but one thing I have to tell you, that was yesterday. The attempt to lift a man off the ground didn't quite work. Couple of reasons. First, a technical hitch. Secondly, the wind on this, one of the highest airfields in the country, just died on us as the evening wore on. Just not enough wind now. The downs, the tail's right down. We have not got enough wind here. Well, look, if we grab this end, it feels like the whole thing that way. I think it's going to lock on the brake. Yeah. Well, no, I can't. The red one is free. No, it's not. What's it flying? It's flying on the brake. There's nothing, it's not pulling on anything at the moment. You, you can't lift me though, can you? Can someone give me a hand on this? I don't know. Well, it's evening now. It's evening calm. Okay, should we try it from there? Okay, yeah. But now it's today, a completely new attempt to do the same thing. Can you just tell us what did go wrong yesterday, David? We had problems, as you said, with the wind, first of all, and also we had quite a lot of friction on the pulley. So we've done some modifications on that, and we think that this time it's going to go. And the, the system you've now devised, is it likely to have a bit more success, do you think? It will have more success. One of the problems, we haven't got a break on it this time, so we've yes. got a safety line down to the ground, but we had that anyway before, so we've just got one less rope to worry about. Your, yeah. your big black carrier kite is absolutely straining it's at the least. Go, yeah. Why don't we let you go? Let's do that. Right. Smooth forward then. Slack on the... Uh, right. Now, David, can you tell me, as you're doing that, how you make the kite lift you off the ground? Well, I'm pulling the, the back of the kite down. You're pulling the back down? Back down, try and catch the wind. There's, there's a lull in the wind at the moment, but it'll pick up again in a second, I think. Uh, hold it around this way, square. Uh, just have to wait for a bit of wind, I think. So, you're certainly, you're lifting. <laughs> Can your kite is letting you? are away! What's it like it's up there, going David? Up, going up quite steadily. It's taking a while to get the feet of the controls. I pull the blue line down a bit more. 
Your blue line is for pulling the, the kite down. The blue line is the, the tail down tackle. Yes. If I pull that down a bit more, it should go up a bit more. It's pulling fairly steadily, a bit gusty. Now, the wind's died a bit. I'll try and break its ascent. Are you trimming the kite? I'm trying to trim the kite, but the wind has died a fraction here. No, it wind's down again. Well, it's let you down gently yeah, it's enough. Very difficult, actually, hanging on to this. Because I've got nothing to brace myself with. If I try standing oh, well, across the basket. Want, um, Hang on, let's try again. David, the lifter kites higher up are really, They're really being lifted, so there must be more powerful air streams higher up. I know, I'm trying to get up to a greater height. Well, you're certainly doing that now. You're a bird man, David Turner. How does it feel? It feels great. Are you frightened? Uh, no, I'm worrying about what to do at the moment. I think I'm going to try and go up a little bit higher. I'll pull the back down a bit more. That's it, it's going up again now. Quite a wind up here. Does it feel steady, David? It feels very steady. How do you feel now that you're, you're recreating Colonel Cody's great man-lifting system? I'm very honoured to be in this situation, actually. Fantastic view up here. 